So, well, I, I would like to say a word in Spanish. Bueno, quería agradecer a las organizadoras la oportunidad de presentar nuestro trabajo aquí, especialmente en este congreso, que lucha por dar voz y visibilizar a colectivos que han estado históricamente oprimidos y más en el campo académico. Así que muchas gracias. Muy obrigada por la oportunidad, G. Eh, es un placer para mí. Ok, so now I will switch to English um, to present our work on unraveling the millisecond austerity activation of an enzyme that is imidazole glycerol phosphate synthase by means of computational tools. Okay, but first of all, let me introduce what proteins are. Proteins are important biomolecules that are involved in a wide range of biological processes. And in particular, enzymes uh, are proteins that, that are able to catalyze specific chemical reactions. And one of the main characteristics of proteins and enzymes is their intrinsic dynamism and flexibility. So far from the traditional view of one protein, one structure, one function, we have to consider proteins as an ensemble of different structures. And all these structures and conformations that the protein can sample can be represented um, as function of energy in a three-dimensional plot that informs us about the relative stabilities and the energy barriers that separate uh, these conformations. And this is important because some of these conformations will be active, catalytically active, while some others will be catalytically inactive. And these transitions between conformations are characterized by different motions that can be fast motions that usually involve uh, lower energy barriers or slow motions, uh, like allosteric transitions that we are going to study in this work that involves uh, higher energy barriers and occurring the millisecond to second time scales. Okay, now. <laughs> oh. Okay. But first, let me introduce the concept of allosteric because allosteric is an intrinsic property of proteins, but its definition is not straightforward. Indeed, Jacques Monod referred to this term as the second secret of life after the genetic code, because allosteric regulation is it's what enables all living organisms to adapt to changing environmental conditions. And this concept in proteins can be generally described as that the binding of a molecule at one side of the protein is transmitted to another distal functional site. And this allows for activity or function regulation. And an nice analogy to allosteric can be, for example, the domino effect, or when you touch a violin string and the vibration is transmitted, producing a sound. However, the molecular basis of these allosteric mechanisms are still poorly understood. Okay, but to understand allosteric, we have to do it in terms of a free energy landscape. And the concept of population shift is key for understanding the allosteric effects in proteins. Because in most cases, the binding of an effector produces an allosteric transition and induces a change on the relative stabilities, redistributing the populations of the free energy landscape. And this uh, can affect, can lower the energy barriers and facilitate the population of the catalytically active states. So in this work, we are going to study allosteric in a, in a model system that is imidazole glycerol phosphate synthase, or IGPS. This is an heterodimeric enzyme in which each monomer catalyzes a different reaction. And here we're going to focus on the reaction that uh, happens in the Hizate subunit, that is the glutaminase hydrolysis reaction, where glutamine is hydrolyzed into glutamate and into ammonia. This ammonia will be important for the second reaction that is catalyzed here in the HISF subunit and is involved in histidine and purine biosynthetic pathways. However, as you can see here, the catalytic activity of this uh, reaction is quite low. Well, now what happens if an allosteric effector, that is PFAR, is bound here? This allosteric effector in the HISF subunit is 30 amstrons away from the glutaminase active site that is here. But as you can see here, when this PFAR is present in the HISF subunit, the catalytic activity of this reaction, of the glutaminase hydrolysis reaction, increases three orders of magnitude compared to the one in the apostate. That means in the absence of this allosteric effector. So here the question is why the binding of the effector that is far away from this active site can have this huge impact on the catalytic activity. 
Okay, so this happens because IGPN is an allosterically regulated enzyme. That means that the effector binding modifies the intrinsic dynamism of the enzyme, and this produces a conformational change in the active site where glutamine is bound. And this has an impact on the catalytic activity. And with some NMR studies, they have shown that the required allosteric transition takes place in the millisecond time scale. However, this allosteric transition and the allosterically active state has not been described yet. Okay, so our hypothesis is that the conformational change that occurs in the HSH subunit in the active site is an oxyanion hole formation. Well, an oxyanion hole is a region on the active site that can stabilize a negative charge. And this is particularly important here because in the glutaminase hydrolysis reaction, a negatively charged uh, tetrahedral intermediate is formed. So our hypothesis is that the effector PFAR is important to induce this conformational change that is characterized by the rotation of this amide backbone of valine 51 that will stabilize this trans and negative charge formed in the, in the reaction. However, the rotation of this oxyanion strand has not been characterized yet. So in this work, we want to validate this hypothesis. Okay, so the main objective of this work is to unravel this allosteric millisecond activation mechanism of the enzyme by means of computational tools. And to accomplish this goal, we want to characterize the allosterically active state. We want to reconstruct the process of substrate binding and the allosteric activation. And most importantly, we want to design a general computational protocol to characterize this type of allosteric transitions that occur in millisecond time scales. So to study these protein motions, we are going to use molecular dynamic simulations because with molecular dynamic simulations, we can have a detailed description of structural and dynamics of biomolecules along time. However, with conventional molecular dynamic simulations, we are limited to sample events that occur in a few microseconds. And as you can see here, allosteric transitions are found in the millisecond to second time scales. So we are going to use a combination of enhanced sampling techniques that speed up these MD simulations by introducing an artificial bias to encourage the system to cross high energy barriers that are typical of these allosteric transitions. And in particular in this work, we are going to use accelerated molecular dynamic simulations to characterize the allosteric transition upon substrate binding. And we are going to use also metadynamic simulations to characterize the free energy landscape of this allosteric transition. Okay, so first we analyze how the effector PFAR affects the enzyme conformational dynamics and the oxyanion hole formation when the substrate glutamine is not uh, present in the active site. So to this end, we perform conventional molecular dynamic simulations. And from these simulations, we monitor the formation of the oxyanion hole by analyzing two different dihedral angles, the phi angle of glycine 50 and the phi angle of uh, valine 51 that is directly related um, to the oxyanion hole formation. So as you can see here in the upper state, we can sample one major state where the oxyanion hole remains in the inactive form. So this amide backbone of valine 51 is not pointing towards the active site that is here. However, in the PFAR bound state, we can sample an extra state that corresponds to the one with the amide backbone pointing towards the active site. So, this is in line with our hypothesis that states that the PFAR binding is a requisite to explore this active state. And for the first time, we have been able to characterize this active state. However, the allosteric processes cannot be completely understood if the substrate is not present. So to understand the role of the substrate glutamine, we reconstructed the substrate uh, binding process and we placed the substrate molecule outside the protein and we started accelerated molecular dynamic simulations to simulate this spontaneous binding process. Because with accelerated MD simulations, we can speed up these binding events and we can make accessible the study of millisecond uh, time scale processes. And our sampling strategy is based on starting these AMD simulations from the different, different states that we sample in the previous uh, conventional molecular dynamic simulations. And as you can see here, we observe uh, binding events in both the APO and PFARON states. However, we only observe one or two binding events for each. That means that this uh, process is an infrequent, it's, it's a rare, rare event. 
Okay. So in this video, you will see we placed the substrate outside the molecule, and this substrate glutamine at some point will be able to recognize the entrance of the active site here. Here we have the substrate, glutamine. This is the oxyanion strand. This is the amide backbone of valine 51. And those are the catalytic, uh, this is the catalytic trite, the catalytic uh, residues. And at some point, the substrate glutamine is able to bind in the active site. However, as you can see here, this amide backbone is not pointing towards the active site. So here, the oxyanion hole is not formed. And with this, we can say that this oxyanion hole formation is not a requisite for the substrate binding, because we observe this uh, substrate binding process in both in the apple and the Pfefferbaum state. And this is also in line with kinetic parameters, because they have similar uh, KM values. However, these results do, um, do not explain the significant difference on the catalytic activity for this glutaminase hydrolysis reaction. So to answer this question, we extended the accelerated molecular dynamic simulations to 10 microseconds. And if we extend these simulations in the PFAR bound state, here we have the effect of PFAR. If we, ex if we extend these simulations, here we have the substrate glutamine and the oxyanion strand. This amide backbone of valine 51 at some point is able to rotate. And this is what uh, will stabilize the transient negative charge of this glutaminase hydrolysis reaction. And well, this is, this is quite uh, amazing because in one single simulation, in a one single AMD simulation, we can have the substrate binding process, the allosteric activation and the oxyanion hole formation. Um, well, however, with these AMD simulations, we cannot uh, have an accurate railway of this energy landscape of this transition, of this allosteric transition. So, from the previous AMD simulations, we have characterized these two different poses. The one that uh, with the oxyanion hole not formed because this amide backbone is not pointing towards the active site that we call the inactive state. And the other one where this amide backbone is pointing towards the active site that we call the active state. And as you can see here, the distance between the substrate and the catalytic system is shorter in this active state than in the inactive one. Well, now we will use these two conformations that we obtain in the AMD simulations as a starting point for metadynamic simulations in order to reconstruct the energy barriers of this allosteric transition. And to facilitate the conformational exploration of the oxyanion strand uh, conformational space, we have started metadynamic simulations from five different active structures and five different inactive structures. Okay, so in metadynamic simulations, what we do is to encourage the system to transition between these two states, inactive uh, from active and active uh, to inactive, in order to characterize this energy barrier between these two states. And in the case of the APO, we can see that we have an energy barrier of 22 kcal per mole. However, if we do the same in the PFAR bound state, we can see that the energy barrier between the inactive and active state decreases to 8 kcal per mole. And this indicates that the transition between these two states is more frequent. That is in line with kinetic parameters that indicate that the reaction is much faster in the presence of PFAR. Therefore, in the absence, of this allosteric effector, the barrier is significantly higher and the conformational transition can be the rate limiting step of, of this glutaminase hydrolysis reaction. While in the presence of PFAR, the rate limiting step may be the chemical step itself. Okay, so in this work, we have been able to computationally characterize the active state and the millisecond motions that define the allosteric mechanism of this enzyme. We also have been able to reconstruct the substrate binding process for both the APO and PFAR bound states. And most importantly, we have been able to design a computational protocol to characterize these long time scale motions. And well, I would like to thank the people involved in this project, Silvia Ferran and Miguel Angel, also my supervisors, Mark and Silvia, and all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you. We... We are waiting for two questions. Okay. Um, Christina for Wendy. Hi, 
I'm Cristina. Sorry, I don't know how to write my question in the Q and I section. <laughs> Actually, you can't because you are a, a panelist, so that's why you, you have to make it loud. Ah, okay. It wasn't that I was so... <laughs> no. um, uh, Carla, thank you very much for that nice talk and great show. And I would like to ask you something. As that this heterodimeric complex, uh, they have maybe a huge uh, binding interface, protein-protein binding interface. You yeah. characterize very well the, the allosteric site and the uh, catalytic site, but which is the rule of protein interface? Maybe to propagate from one uh, monomer to the other, you may see something in the interface. Yeah, and actually it's, it's very nice because maybe I have it here. Yes, so here we have the effector binding site and we can see a lot of changes most of them are in the interface uh, going from the, this uh, effector bending side to the glutamine, glutamine uh, active side. And well, yes, we have this interface that have a lot of different changes in this allosteric transition. And also we have a channel that is where the ammonia is, uh, is transmitted. So I don't know if I, I answer your yeah, question. Yes, yeah. so I, I thought that you might study the interface as well, apart from the two uh, sites. Ah, well, okay. the active site of glutamine is, is quite, uh, is close to the interface. It's almost in the interface. So you have binding residues of both of his H active site here, and also his F. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have two questions from Wendy also. Okay, thank you. Very, very nice talk. And there are method, methods that we don't use. And the first question uh, that I have is, if you can tell us a bit, how do you accelerate your MD? That's the first question. And the second one is, um, uh, do you consider, um, for example, that uh, to, to, to bind the glutamine or to go the glutamine into the binding site um, a coarse grain simulation? Well, I will go for the first answer. Uh, well, with AMD simulations, what we are doing is So what we do is we have the uh, potential energy surface and we start from an X-ray that is here. And what we do is we put a non-negative boost potential in order to flatten the energy surface and to facilitate the transition between these states. And that's why we accelerate these to visit, to sample all these states that the protein can sample. I don't know if I am answering you. Yes, yes, thank you. And the second one, we have thought about, about coarse grain, but it's a quite a small system. And it is very interesting to see all the interactions that in more in detail. So that's, that's why we do simulations in, with all atom and the simulations. Yeah, I agree, but just to, you know, to see, the events of going in, I don't know, it's just what I was thinking, this event. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, Carla, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, your talk is amazing. And now we are moving forward uh, to present our uh, next speaker, which is Angélica Sandoval Pérez. Hello, Angélica. Can you turn on your, your video? Hello, Angélica. Welcome. Thank you. You can start when, you, when you're ready. OK. So can you see my screen? Yes. 
Okay. Um, okay. So, in Spanish first, so, eh, gracias por, por la invitación y por darme este espacio para, para hablar. Eh, me siento muy, muy honrada por esta oportunidad. So now in, in English. And so I will like to talk about uh, the work that I and my group has been developing in the last two years. Uh, this has been done in, in Bogota, Colombia, in the University of Los Andes. And it's a work that is already published. So if you want to check, you can find uh, here the, the publication that is a um, nucleic acid research paper, so you can check it. So I will talk about the interaction of a uh, blood protein called the von Willebrand factor and extracellular uh, DNA. Uh, this interaction is important because of um, a key immunological process known like netosis. Netosis is, it was described quite recently Uh, like 20, 15 years ago, where uh, neutrophiles try to control a systemic infection known like sepsis. And for that, they uh, release all their insights, including the DNA. By releasing their insights, they form a network where the bacteria can be trapped and eventually killed. This... Uh, mechanism has also been linked to other pathologies like a metastasis in cancer or it has been found in patients of cystic fibrosis as I mentioned in sepsis also has been related with infertility on pregnancy complications in the flare up of autoimmune diseases or in atherothrombosis so it's actually a quite interesting and and Yeah, an interesting uh, thing to study. So now the von Willebrand factor that is our uh, blood protein. So this protein is um, a molecule that is involved in the coagulation cascade. It gets activated when you have an injured vessel and helps to form a, a blood clot to stop bleeding. If we see it in detail, what is happening is that a, an injured vessel can expose collagen fibrils where the von Willebrand factor can bind and by the flow of the blood, the protein can unfold and exposing a different binding sites for platelets and other uh, things to bind. If we even see zoom in and more the von Willebrand factor, it generally is a dimer, uh, as you can see here, composed by the two monomers with identical number of uh, domains. The domain that is of our interest is this one, the A domain, because there is where the platelets uh, receptors will bind, and also uh, the DNA, as I will show you. So experimentally, it has been shown that actually the DNA and the von Willebrand factor indeed can interact. Uh, but it has a different condition. So when you have platelets in the system, then the DNA binding is impeded. And also something that they reported is that this binding can be affected by heparin and especially by the size of heparin, that is a drug used uh, to avoid uh, coagulation. So with this uh, knowledge, We identify or they identify a domain that was the A1 domain, but still there were some questions opened and this is what we wanted to answer. It's like, what is the molecular mechanism governing this von Willebrand factor and DNA interaction? So first we start uh, using molecular dynamic simulations. Those were uh, unbiased molecular dynamic simulations. We run 42 simulations, each one of 200 nanoseconds. And what we observed was uh, that in the first 50 nanoseconds, the 90% of the cases, the protein and the DNA were coming together. Something uh, that caused 
our attention was that the protein was always interacting through the same side with the DNA, but the DNA was having like different orientations around the protein. When we analyzed more in detail which uh, parts of the protein were binding to the DNA, we were able to identify uh, four residues. All of them were arginines. Three of them were located at the helix four. That is the one here highlighted in red and is equivalent to this part here in the protein. So our three arginines are uh, 30, 19, uh, 2, 95, and 99, and then one arginine here back. For the DNA, on the other hand, what we observe is that the protein was uh, located everywhere. So the DNA here is this pink cloud, while uh, the location of the protein is represented here by this blue, red, and green, cl green cloud. So we can see here that the protein is everywhere. Uh, to observe a, a bit more in detail this, we calculated the uh, portion of interaction time that each residue in the protein was spending uh, with the DNA. And as I mentioned, these three arginines were the relevant ones. And here we can identify where DNA is binding. And I also can see here where the GP1B alpha is supposed to bind. The GP1B alpha is the platelet receptor. So this is interesting because they are actually not a uh, sharing binding site. So we identified these three arginines. We also wanted to confirm these observations. So we ran some cross grain uh, simulations for that um, people in Cambridge help us with the model and with the simulations. And we had a similar uh, trend. So the helix four is the, is the binding site for the DNA and there is a, an arginine here back distant that is also relevant. And for the DNA, we were observing something similar. It is not having a really a specific site where the protein can't bind. Uh, we also run some Brownian dynamic simulations. In the Brownian dynamic simulations, we assume uh, that those uh, structures are rigid bodies. We identify in the helix four as an important binding site and the DNA was not having a, um, a specific site. And here we also were able to uh, calculate how much time was spent the DNA with either part of the protein, that was the helix four, uh, here specified by these three arginines, uh, or the back arginine, or if we were having a double occupancy that we observe it is a really small percentage, either in coarse grain or in molecular dynamic simulations, a lysine patch that was important in coarse grain, but not so important in molecular dynamic simulations, and then other parts of uh, the protein. Uh, so now that we identify these arginines, uh, we assume that the forces leading this interaction were electrostatic forces. Then we wanted to know which arginine was contributing the most uh, to the stability of the interaction. So we ran some mutational analysis. So we took a complex where the, the, uh, the DNA and the protein were found, and then we uh, performed some mutations, single mutations, double mutations, triple mutations, to see what was the effect of, of such a mutation. We exchanged the arginine per alanine, that is a neutral hydrophobic amino acid, or uh, we also ran some other experiments where we exchanged the arginine by a negatively charged uh, residue. So what we can see here is a wide range of changes. So we can see local destabilization, like what we observe here in this first a single mutation, but we can also, uh, sorry, when we change, uh, for example, this arginine, the 1399, what we observe is a more uh, general destabilization of the interaction. And also we start to observe certain peaks here. That means that the protein is reorientating uh, with respect to the DNA. And this is something similar to what we observe in the double mutation or the triple mutation. When we make a mutation of the arginines for a negatively charged residue, 
what we can have is even a detachment of the protein. So it uh, hints even more strongly to these uh, electrostatic forces leading this interaction. So now with all these computational studies and calculations, we uh, made some experimental uh, or ran some experiments uh, that was done by Ricarda in Munich. So she was taking our A1 domain, wild type and mutant. And then she was checking how the binding of the DNA was happening, if it was happening. So she took the wild type and then uh, she's able to see a change in fluorescence when she takes the wild type and the DNA, that is what you observe here, and it means binding. When she has a, a A1 domain mutant or when she increases the salt concentration, when we, what we observe is a diminishment on the DNA and the protein binding. That is what we observe here. So this curve with this change in fluorescence is not a, any longer present, it means there is no binding. We also wanted to have a more realistic setup and for that we took the dimer of the protein and we check if the protein was able to bind to the DNA or not. And also, as I mentioned in the introduction, this uh, protein needs of uh, the shear flow of blood to get activated and to expose the binding sites. So we also wanted to check if that was needed in our case. And that is what Ricardo once again was doing. So she took a DNA a fragment, then she, she checked uh, how it was behaving. If we observe, and then she put it with the protein, if she observed this shifting here, it means binding. That is what we need to know here. Something <clears throat> that she wanted to see was a, what happens when we steer at different frequencies? It means like we apply different uh, forces or to, to see if uh, the activation of the protein will depend or not of it. So that is what we observe in this figure. So here in the gray lines that are here, we have just the DNA either steering the sample uh, or not. We do not see binding. And then we have the DNA plus the protein we steer the sample with two different frequencies, and then we observe binding. Um, he also took different soil concentrations, and there is where she started to observe that there is a gradual decreasement on the binding between the protein and the DNA. So it is now not just a computational work, but also experimental data that support our assumption that this is lit by electrostatic force. And now our golden uh, test was a microfluidic experiment. So in microfluidic experiments, we can have an environment that is quite similar to what we have in our vessels. So in this setup, we have a chamber where we have two cells one here and one here, they are connected by a channel. When we have a sample in one of the cells, we can apply a force and then the fluid from here will go to this cell having something similar to what we have in our uh, vessels. When we have our wild type protein, we observe certain conglomerates, but when we have a mutant, then these conglomerates are not any longer visible. So I have a video that maybe will help a bit with the visualization. So these bright lines are aggregates between the DNA and the protein. When we have our mutant, these aggregates are not longer visible. Nice. So now we have all of this information. And then the last question that we wanted to answer was uh, if the binding sites for the DNA and the platelet receptors were different, why we were observing this impediment of each other uh, in the binding of the fumarin factor and what was happening with heparin. So we can explain the impediment of a platelet or a DNA binding to the fumarin factor in one domain because of the steric clashes. 
So they are two huge molecules. And when one of them is already present there and bound to the A1 domain, then the other one will not bind any longer because there is not a space for it to, to accommodate. Uh, and something similar can explain the observation for heparin. So they have different binding sites, but then when you have and then when you have a small heparin, then you don't have these clashes. And then DNA can can go and bind easily. But when you have a big heparin, then the binding of DNA is not any longer so easy. So as a summary, uh, I want you to take it to home <laughs> that we uh, identify uh, a specific binding site for the DNA to bind the from factory factor in one domain. Though that uh, interaction is stabilized by three arginines is an electrostatic uh, interaction. And also that the binding sites for the DNA and the platelet receptors are actually different. So I want to thank to the people that, that either collaborate with us or gave us advice in our work. Uh, they were different groups located in Germany and in the UK. Um, and also to my group uh, here in Bogota, to the Max Planck Tandem Group in Computational Biophysics, which BI is uh, Camilo Aponte Santa Maria. So I want to thank and if thank you for listening to me, and if you have questions, I will be happy to to answer them. Well, thank you very much, Angelica. Your talk is amazing. It's a lot of work. Thank um, you. I have a question for you. You yeah. said that you simulate two hundred nanoseconds. Mm, yeah, no, actually, we we ran a 40, for the association a study, we ran 42 uh, simulations, each one of 200 nanoseconds. Uh, I think it was around uh, 70 microseconds, if I'm, I'm right, and then we had a, the mutation analysis, and it was around 6 microseconds of simulation time for molecular dynamics. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question from Paula. Uh, she asked, the, uh, do you know if other components of the net, like Elastase or MPO, bind to uh, BWF? BWF is a highly promiscuous protein. So a lot of things can bind to, to this uh, protein, but actually there is not that much knowledge on the uh, specific components uh, that they stabilize or form the net. So this is still a, a word that is, is going on and it's still something that people is studying. But sure, it can be, it can have a lot of things because it's not just DNA and it's just not blood proteins because it's the whole inside of a neutrophile. So there are histones, there are like a, the DNA is not completely unfolded. So it can be a lot of different components. Yeah. Well, Angelica, thank you very much. Thank you. We don't have any more questions. So. Thank you for your talk. We go to the next presentation. Uh, we will introduce to uh, Lani Sandoval Perez. Can you hear me? I lost my my view. I can see the, the screen, the participants. Sorry, who is the next? The next is Lani Ruiz Perez. Oh. She's here, but I don't know. Oh, hey. 
Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, now, yeah. Okay. Um, is it better sound quality like this? Or if I plug my headphones and do this? Is it better like this? It's, it's yes. okay. It is okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you try to share your screen? Share screen. Yes. Share. Are you getting that? Yeah. Yes. Wood. Um. Okay, I want look because I've never done this before. I wanted the um. One of the presenters before had a pointer and it changed the settings somewhere here. What's this? Try ah. <laughs> Oh, okay. amazing. This, this is my first virtual presentation. So this is my first virtual lasser. Um, so are we okay to go? Yes. Should I also share? my video you have a video now um start video ah no no with without your camera as you want without the camera okay. as you want yes now i can see you <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay okay let's um, start thank you um so this is um my um phd work um and I'm going to be talking about the molecular dynamics of permeation of short peptides across a model of the skin's lipid barrier. Um, and Ricardo Mancera is my um, main supervisor. This is work uh, done at Curtin University. So, mm, why is this not? Okay. Um, the context of this work is um, transdermal drug delivery, which is a form of drug delivery that is advantageous for drugs that require prolonged dosage, localized skin activity, and drugs that need to avoid um, the oral passage or the intramuscular or intravenous injection. Um, because of um, the danger of metabolism breaking up the activity of the molecule. One example of the very few that are approved by FDA currently is patches that contain um, estradiol, for example. Um, and the limitations of this type of application, despite all of the advantages that it offers, um, these limitations arise from the barrier function of the skin, which makes the available applications really reduced, and in particular to the molecular weight of the drugs or the uh, candidates, um, and also to a reduced set of chemical properties that they show. And so the barrier of the skin, it's actually located in the stratum corneum, where we see a set of lipid bilayers. So the stratum corneum is the topmost layer of the skin, which we see here. Um, and if we zoom into that, we see a brick and mortar structure where the bricks are the um, corneocytes that make up the tissue. And the mortar will be the extracellular space. And if we zoom into that cellular space, we see a series of very ordered, um, highly dehydrated stacked lipid bilayers that um, look like this. And they are formed by three lipid classes, um, which are ceramides, cholesterol, and free fatty acids. And we're interested in permeability estimates in the context of transdermal drug delivery. So an obvious choice would be um, uh, measuring permeability experimentally, which can be done in three ways in vivo as with the patches that I showed in the first slide. Um, 
ex vivo with Fran cells assays that are basically tissue separating two compartments that are monitored over time and in vitro by model lipid bilayers, which is the same principle, but instead of tissue, it's a single bilayer separating two chambers. And so what they do is measure the flux across um, the tissue or the model membrane. The drawbacks of these experiments are that um, the ethics concerns uh, concerning animal and human tissue handling, the inter and intra individual variability, um, the choice of components to represent the skin, it's non-trivial. And um, these applications are limited for high throughput applications. So in view of that, there are a number of computational approaches that um, include the quantitative structure activity relationship models. Um, and the one drawback of these ones are the reduced chemical space of the training set, which means that if we were to ask the model about a molecule that does not share many features with the training set, then we wouldn't um, be able to trust the um, estimate. And then a second option on the computational approaches is molecular dynamics. And this is our um, choice um, because it offers atomic resolution because it gives us insight into the molecular mechanism of how these drugs permeate. And the main drawback and very well known in the field is the choice of force field and the sampling problem, which um, the other speakers have um, briefly mentioned. Um, so in our approach to tackle these two problems, what we do is a combination of conventional umbrella sampling with um, replica, with one of the flavors of replica exchange with solute tempering. And what we get from the first is the ability to restrain the molecule in different parts of the system, which means that we can um, enhance the sampling by covering the entire translocation path as the molecule uh, goes into and across the lipid bilayer. And then later we can obtain the free energy profile, um, which will give us the delta G, which is what we're interested in. And um, the flavor of replica exchange with solute tempering that we use is actually a novel method that we're validating and developing in our group. And we call it REST3 because it builds up on previous iteration of the method. And our code enables the selective downscaling of the non-bonded interactions between any given pair of molecules in the system. And this offers us the possibility to downscale separately the electrostatics and the van der Waals, and also any, any pair of molecules. As I said, in this case, we're interested in downscaling the interactions between the peptide or the drug candidate and the solvent and the lipid bilayer. And we do this creating a replica ladder where, uh, where the base replica is the one where no scaling is occurring and the one where we um, run our analysis on, the ground replica. And the replica in the highest part of the ladder is the one that has the highest scaling, which means the highest, um, sorry, the lowest value of the interactions. And what we want with this is that to create interactions that are weak and short-lived, and these will enhance the sampling, which means we will be able to visit other um, configurations and orientations. Um, and um, to address how we simulate the lipid bilayers, then we set a simulation box that contains roughly a um, hundred ish um, lipid molecules in a symmetric lipid bilayer. And these uh, numbers of molecules are chosen to represent 
the main components of the stratum corneum in their molar ratio. We also um, simulate the system surrounded by um, around 6,000 water molecules, which was the um, single point charge water model. And we use one of the small peptides or drug candidates uh, in each of the systems. We do this in the MPG ensemble, keeping the pressure um, constant with the Parinello Raman um, barostat and the temperature constant with the Nose Hoover at skin temperature, which corresponds to 32 Celsius. And we chose the Gromos 5047, which is a United Atom Force Field. We run this, as I said, in the uh, Gromax 4.6.7 and is an in-house code um, that features our um, enhanced sampling approach. And for those of you that um, are not very familiar with lipid bilayers, um, we will have different sections uh, or regions within the lipid bilayer um, or the system. So the first one is the bulk water, which is the water corresponding to where no um, um, other things except but water interactions are occurring. Then we find the interface, which is where the head groups meet the water, the head groups of the lipids meet the water. Then we go on to a dense, densely packed and highly ordered region of the lipid tails, which is fully hydrophobic. And then we go to an interdigitating region, which is less dense and less ordered. Um, and for the validation of the method, which is the first thing that I want to show tonight, is the we chose to um, simulate a dipeptide, which is um, valine tryptophan, for which we found experimental information that we could contrast with. So here I'm showing the free energy profile as a function of the distance between the lipid bilayer and the peptide. And I'm um, showing here the regions that I just mentioned. Um, we show a hint of when we're in the bulk water, the energies are reference. And as the molecule approaches the interface, there is a favorable interaction. And as we force the molecule to go into the membrane and cross this part, we see the energy rising quite dramatically. And we observe that with our approach, which is the blue line, we find a free energy that is um, more similar to the experimental free energy. And from the profile, we, we also see that it makes much more sense than to have equally favorable states um, inside the membrane and at the surface of the membrane, which is what the conventional sampling was showing. Um, additionally, when we calculate the uh, permeability coefficient from our simulations, we see that our method gives us better agreement in terms of the order of magnitude of the permeability coefficient, gives better agreement with experimental. Um, other experimental information that was produced in our research institute uh, by my co-supervisor and her colleagues is the finding that when um, this tetrapeptide was conjugated to a lipid tail, it retain its activity, which is the first thing that um, we're interested in. It retains its activity as the inhibitor of the human neutrophil elastase. And this means it has a direct application as a treatment for uh, skin conditions where there's inflammation like eczema. Um, and so not only keeps its activity, but it enhances, it increases the retention in the skin, which is also of interest for this application because it's, it takes um, lo uh, longer times to release the dose. 
Um, but they also found in a following study that the effect of the lipid tail has stereoselectivity because the lipid tail can be uh, one of two isomers and the effect of the lipid tail is also depending on how many carbons attach to it. So to check these um, effects and this experimental information, we set to um, simulate three different molecules that have skin activity. One of them is not actually a peptide, but a peptide-like molecule. And each of them, we simulate the parent molecule with one of two lipid tails. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, the results for the first molecule, which is amino lebulinic acid. And this is a, mo a drug molecule that is approved for the treatment of um, skin cancer. And we are going to simulate these molecules with the same um, lipid bilayer that I showed before. So what we observed with the simulation of these systems is that uh, the parent molecule, the 5 ala amino lemonic acid in orange, shows a um, profile that shows a uh, somehow favorable interaction around the interface, but then the overall delta G is unfavorable. And we see a more drastic effect when we attach a 4 carbon lipid tail to this molecule. In brown, we see an excessively high free energy of interaction. But when we attach a carbon lipid tail that is longer with eight carbons, we observe that this is the one that makes um, the interaction and the permeability favorable. With the other two molecules, the simulations are complete and are pending some of the analysis, but the free energy profiles um, show a similar story whereby one of the lipid tails shows better improvement uh, or improvement that the other one doesn't. So in summary, our enhanced sampling approach shows better agreement with experimental permeability. And this is with the um, large unilamellar, unilamellar vesicle um, experiments. And uh, our pre preliminary data also confirms that the lipid conjugates of different lengths differ in their enhancement of permeability. What we are doing at the moment is setting up and running the simulations that will um, gain insight, give us some insight into the effect of the stereochemistry for which we set them with either one of the two stereoisomers. So the dextro or the level um, lipoamino acid. And we expect to see what's the difference in the interactions and what makes them, what makes one of them more permeable than the other. Um, and now I would like to thank my group in Curtin University, Cofuturo, my sponsor from Colombia, uh, POSI, the Supercomputer Center, and um, the scholarship that I have at the moment. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lani. We have a question from Angelica. She asked, how do you deal with the disruption of the membrane that happens in umbrella sampling and its contribution to the free energy calculation? Yes, um, that's, a, that's a good question, Angelica, thank you. Um, we do um, equilibrate the membrane and each of the windows separately such that the data that we use to retrieve the free energy is after at least 10 to 20 nanoseconds into the production run. So what I'm trying to say is we discard the beginning 10 to 20 or sometimes 30 nanoseconds of the beginning of the production run to equilibrate. And then we start measuring 
our properties from the rest of the production run, which comes to uh, sometimes more than 100 nanoseconds per window. So that's one way. Uh, so we trust that our equilibration and the replica exchange will take care of the little disturbing in the membrane caused by inserting the peptide there. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Lati. Thank you for your talk, your amazing talk. We are thank going you. to introduce our text uh, speaker, which is Patricia Soto. Thank you, Lani. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. You can start, Patricia, when you feel. Yep. Um... Let's see if this works. Uh, I'm gonna try again. Okay, it's working now. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so do I have 15 minutes, right? Yes, you do. Okay, I'm just gonna time myself. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure I am on time. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to present. I'm very excited today. Uh, the talks that we have had this morning have been amazing, super inspiring and super useful for my own uh, research. So I'm glad, I'm glad I have listened to all of them. So uh, today I wanna talk to you about the work that we have been doing on understanding the structural dynamics of the prion protein. Um, so that is the science of my talk. Um, uh, but before we do into science, I want to be super honest and I want to tell you why I'm giving this talk. So the first goal that I have is to receive feedback from all of you so that we can finally submit this paper. And uh, certainly I consider this audience will help me in strengthening our uh, interpretation of the data that's my goal number one. And my goal number two is um, to open channels for potential collaborations. Uh, this has been a goal of mine since I started my faculty position at Creighton University. As you can see in the map, Creighton University, uh, let me show this, um, is located a kind of in the middle of the US. And since I started my position, I have always wanted to establish collaborations with um, scientists from uh, Latin America. And uh, so I hope this time we will make it. Um, so prion protein, which is the uh, topic in my, the main topic in my research project is a very unique protein. So the prion protein became famous because it is associated with prion diseases. Um, prion diseases, for those of you who are not familiar with those, are fatal neurodegenerative diseases that affect some humans and affect some mammals. So on the slide, you can see a number of uh, uh, symptoms, clinical symptoms that have been uh, detected in humans. Um, this is considered a sort of dementia type of disease. This disease has been classified in the same family as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. Um, however, prion diseases are much more rare. So we actually have only one person per million per year worldwide being diagnosed with CJD, which is one of the forms of prion disease in humans. Uh, 
although I'm saying only one, it sounds like little, but it's actually many if you consider how many people we are in the world, right? And if we consider how many years we have had. So this, although it is rare, we do have a population afflicted by this disease. And of course, there is no cure. Once uh, clinical symptoms uh, are uh, detected, uh, the patient uh, dies within about six months. There are, there are a few other interesting characteristics of this disease. So the first one that I want to highlight is that this disease ha shows what is called a dynamic species barrier. It means that um, this disease is transmitted between hosts and it is also transmitted between the species and the ability to transmit between the species uh, changes. For example, um, mad cow disease infected humans uh, back in the in the 90s. Um, in, in, in another slide, I will elaborate a little bit more on this idea. Um, another interesting feature of this disease is that some hosts and species do not develop clinical symptoms. Um, so what are the molecular features of prion diseases? Um, the one molecular feature in which everybody agrees is the presence of the cellular form of the prion protein. Now, many experiments highlight the presence of what is called a prion, which is the actual aggregated form of the prion protein. When the prion protein is found in prions, it's called PRPSC. However, the amount of PRPSC does not correlate with the severity of the clinical symptoms. So that poses a number of questions and, and focuses um, uh, investigations in understanding the cellular form of the prion protein. So what happens with these uh, diseases? Well, it happens that there is a potential for public health risks. Um, mad cow disease generated what is called variant CJD uh, in the 90s. Um, right now in the US and Norway, there is a prevalence that has been increasing through uh, the years of CWD, which is the prion disease in uh, deer and elk. What happens? Well, it happens that actually we do not know whether CWD, the disease in, uh, in elk, will cross the dynamic species barrier and infect humans. Um, this poses a public health risk because in the United States, uh, there is a big um, a industry, so to speak, a, around hunting of a, a elk and deer and consumption of the meat. So we really want to know whether CWD could infect humans. Uh, we want to know that and we need, we want to be able to prevent or cure that potential transmission. So the prion protein has a myriad of possible physiological and pathological functions. This is quite interesting because it opens up the big uh, a Pandora box, right? Like, what happens? What, wh why do we have this prion protein? So a number of experiments have proposed a number of different um, functions for the prion protein. Here on the slide, you can see a very nice review published by um, another group. This, this is actually an Italian group uh, that published this review recently. And what we can tell is that prion protein has been found linked to a number of physiological functions and, a, and it has also been found to be related to uh, other diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cancer. There is one big issue, standard structural biophysics, wet lab experiments, and cell biology, wet lab experiments, are very hard, very hard to be performed on the monomer prion protein. Why? Because this prion protein, in a wet lab experiment condition, aggregates very easily. So part of the reason why we have this unknown list of 
functions is the difficulty of working experimentally with the prion protein. So let me give you a quick overview of the prion protein structure. So the, the prion protein structure has ba basically two big domains, the N terminus, which is a disordered region. This disordered region contains uh, five octa repeats. The number of, the, of, of octa repeats actually depends on the species. Uh, this N terminus also has a highly hydrophobic fragment. And then we have a nicely uh, C terminal a uh, nicely folded C terminal that shows alpha helices and beta sheets. It does also show uh, glycosylation sites. Uh, the other post translational modification is the presence of a GPI anchor that anchors the prion protein on the cell membrane. So the prion protein is actually an extracellular uh, protein. So on this side of the slide, I have a scheme of, and, the, and this is kind of a speculation, okay, um, a, a, a plot of the free energy of this prion protein. And the one message from this uh, plot is that we really don't know a lot. We don't understand very well the monomer PRPC. Uh, we do not understand well how PRPC misfolds. We don't understand the factors that affect that misfolding and once the prion protein aggregates, we don't understand yet how different structures of the aggregated form are toxic or non-toxic, and how those different conformations could develop into very different or distinct clinical symptoms. So this is a fascinating uh, protein to work on because there are many uh, unknowns. Um, so this is a general overview of some protein, uh, some prion protein um, uh, structures that we have been studying in my lab. Uh, so part of this work has been done by one of my students, Stephanie Wynn, that you can see up here. So what we decided to do was to look at the prion protein from a number of species, each species showing different degree of susceptibility to the disease. So something to call our attention is that all these proteins, um, all the prion protein is a highly conserved protein, and we have highlighted the very few uh, mutations that we observe. So what are the burning questions about the prion protein? So first question is to understand the structural dynamics of PRPC. And the goal that we have uh, by approaching that question is to help elucidate the physiological function of the prion protein. Our second goal is to understand structural dynamics that relates to detectable prion disease. Um, the idea being that we should be, we wish we could, we wish we could understand uh, the effect of the residue substitutions on a possible pathological misfolding pathways. Now, to answer these questions, we decided to focus on the C terminus, which is the nicely folded prion protein, as you saw on the previous slide. That is the one region of the prion protein that shows uh, genetic polymorphisms. Uh, the end terminal is, is kind of tricky. The end terminal is an um, intrinsically disordered uh, fragment. Uh, it has an interesting patterning of charges. Uh, one of my students, Don Erwin, is focusing on studying that in terminus. Uh, so we don't talk about that yet. Uh, so let's focus first on the first um, question. So in this work uh, that we did together with Heidi Hendrickson, my collaborator from La Falla College, and my student, uh, Garrett, um, we be, we took all these um, PRPC or prion protein structures from the protein data bank. We downloaded all the NMR uh, ensembles and we built the uh, protein residue network. From that network, we then did a number of analysis. And the one that I'm showing in this slide corresponds to the communities analysis. So what we found is that species, the species that we analyzed, show commonalities in the um, 
in the residues that interact with each other. And these commonalities were observed independently of whether the species develops the disease or not. Uh, so we wanted to have a little bit of more insight into this, how much we could trust uh, the calculations based on the NMR and samples alone. So we compare with the previous work that we published in which we studied um, only two forms of uh, ship prion protein. Um, in that case, uh, we performed uh, 16 independent MD trajectories. And the nice feature is that from the MD trajectories and from our NMR ensemble analysis, we identify a common region of the prion protein that uh, forms a strong network of interaction. So we propose that uh, this uh, set of residues correspond to a stability uh, uh, motif in the prion protein. We also looked at uh, other metrics. We look specifically to uh, the betweenness of the residues. And what we found is that the profile is pretty much the same across, across all species. Um, we could not, we didn't find, and I admit I was a little bit biased at the beginning, we could not find um, any correlation between uh, mutations and change in the value of betweenness centrality. So then we move into the second question, which is more into the pathological component of PRPC. And in this case, we look at a different uh, metric. We look at the eigenvector centrality that tells us about the connectivity in the protein structure. And we've started to find some differences between the PRPC structure of a species that are susceptible to the disease that you can see up here, and the uh, PRPC of structures that have been shown to be highly resistant to prion diseases, at least in the uh, natural setting. So then we went to look uh, more carefully about properties of aggregation. So with um, our with my student Stephanie, we looked at the fibrillation propensity of the prion protein uh, of all the species. And we also looked at the uh, solubility profile as an indicator of the ability to aggregate, not necessarily to form febriles, but at least to start the aggregation. And what we found is that in the resistant species, a fragment of the prion protein seems to have increased probability of fibrillation, but decrease and and decrease uh, solubility of the um, third alpha helix. So uh, these results were a little bit uh, surprising to us. We would not expect that we were not expecting that the resistant. Uh, prion proteins uh, increase fibrillation propensity. Um, so for the interruption, but you have five minutes left. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, time for, the, for the question, we have at least two questions for you. OK, 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 thank you. So I probably should move. And then so this is my last slide. So here I have highlighted the burning questions that we have, the, the community of prion uh, protein biophysicists uh, have. Um, our contribution, at least in the first case, which is to elucidate the physiological function of the protein, is uh, that we have identified residues that are dynamically coupled and that provide a stability to the fault. Um, we definitely would like to see how we could link those residues to a physiological function of the prion protein. And if I have a dream, that will be to disentangle um, the many functions that the prion protein has. And if we look at the pathology of the prion protein, we our interpretation is that we have identified the third alpha helix as a what, what, what I have termed a structural sensor that we confer extra stability to the uh, structures that come from resistant species. 
Uh, of course, my dream would be to simulate the misfolding of PRPC, but in my opinion, the technology in terms of hardware of, or and software is not there yet. So I wanna finish with um, acknowledgements to uh, my group. Uh, we have been meeting remotely since March, uh, but we are here ready to do our research. My collaborator, Heidi from Lafaya College, and Ron, who actually is originally from Peru, and Jason Bartz at my institution. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Patricia. We have several questions for you. Uh -huh. The first question first, we want to thank for your, for your talk today, for being us, with us today. I will tell you the first question, which is uh -huh. from Wendy. She asked, which is the membrane conformation? Okay, <laughs> this is a good question. Well, it happens that um, depending on the biophysics experiment, different composition of the membrane has proven to have different effect on PRPC. So uh, some researchers have shown that the, the presence of sphingomyelin, for example, uh, affects the aggregation ability of PRPC. Other experimentalists have shown that the presence of PE or PG affect that ability to aggregate. Other experimentalists have shown that it is the presence of cholesterol. So to give you an answer is that from a purely experimental point of view, we do not understand yet the effect that a membrane composition has on PRPC. Thank you. We have a question from uh, uh, an attendee, which is uh, perhaps in the YouTube channel. She said that, or he said that, I, unfortunately, he or she is close to this horrible lethal and fat disease because a member of the family died from CID. Mm -hmm. And was reading about the work of Sonia Ballard and mm -hmm. her husband about yeah. the use of antisense RNA to inhibit the synthesis of this protein. In your opinion, what do you think if we are close to find a treatment or cure of it? Yeah, uh, I love this question. Uh, I, I follow uh, Sonia Balabar and her husband. I follow their work. Uh, I understand that mm, probably in August, they published a paper in which they claim to have um, a candidate uh, drug to um, as a treatment of prion diseases. I have to be honest at the moment, I do not know the stage in terms of, cl of uh, clinical trials of that specific drug, I do not know. But uh, I believe the quality of their experiments and I believe that if they found an anti-prion uh, molecule, uh, at least for the specific type of disease that Sonia has. So for the audience, Sonia has one of the forms of uh, prion disease, which is called fatal familial insomnia. Hopefully the one drug that they are testing will help cure her. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, Cristina have a question for you, the last uh -huh. question. Yeah. Hi, Patricia. Hi. Nice talk. I have a question. You say that that uh, disease is a weird disease. Not a lot of people has it. But now we know that a long list of proteins, like the very known FUS, TAF15, EWSR1, and a very long uh, list of proteins have the prion-like domain, which is the N-terminal domain of your protein. And all those proteins are implied in neurodegenerative diseases. And are those proteins which are called liquid liquid phase separate, separating proteins mm -hmm. and that make that membrane less organelles. Do you think you could um, apply your research in those other proteins that has the, the, the prion-like domain? Yeah, I'm so grateful that you are asking. Yeah, I'm, I'm very grat grateful that you are asking this question but because this is something that I definitely want to move to, which is studying the interaction between prion protein and other proteins that have been found to be in at least related 
there is no yet cause effect relationship, but related to prion disease uh, mechanisms. There is a very interesting paper that came out just last week in which um, this uh, group of researchers based in UK, uh, they have proposed how other proteins and not only prion protein, PRPC, are involved in the disease. And, and there is a speculation on how the interaction of these proteins uh, somehow uh, triggers toxicity. So definitely something that I want to do, and I have been looking into that, just not ready to present, uh, to see how PRPC interacts with other proteins. Uh, we do have the challenge of the intrinsically disorder uh, fragments. So that's why we are giving our first steps. We have our student and helping us understand uh, the biophysics of those uh, intrinsically disordered fragments. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask something to the organizers? Yes. Yeah. Can I do a 10 second advertisement? Yes. 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, 10 seconds. So can everybody see my slide right now? Sure. Okay, so this is pure advertisement, 10 seconds. Uh, so I, I happen to be a member of the editorial board of The Biophysicist. The Biophysicist is the first journal sponsored by the Biophysical Society to support biophysics education. Any type of scholarship of teaching and learning is welcome. So I invite anybody, everybody, anybody <laughs> who has work, um, to submit uh, to our journal. Uh, this is a, a journal to support education in biophysics. Beauty, an example of, of beautiful work for this journal will be the presentation that we listened to yesterday afternoon, uh, actually from one of the organizers. The biophysicists will be excited to read uh, your submission. We, the editorial board, work with you um, until you have uh, the shape in the paper that we are looking for. Uh, and I appreciate for allowing me to advertise the journal. Well, Patricia, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Nice talk. And we are going to introduce our next speaker, which is Stefania Mancini. Hello, Stefania. Hello. You can start. Yeah. Bueno, puedo agradecer en español, entonces eh, una alegría enorme estar compartiendo estos minutos, además de ver a gente muy querida en la organización y participando, así que muchas gracias por eh, este evento y por el espacio para contar mi trabajo. So now I uh, present uh, my work that it will be it will be difficult because of the such great speaker that were before and also because uh, I have to convince you about <laughs> genomics and functional um, relationships. So the aim of my talk uh, today shows some results that I have from my postdoc. I'm nowadays I'm working in Barcelona and at uh, CRG, and I work as embed bioinformatician in a lab that is uh, the gene regulation stem cells and cancer lab. So the, the main question that they have and that I'm trying to to solve have to do with this uh, biological question. Specifically, especially today I will talk about the aim of reconstruction of splicing networks, and we are trying to find a new insight into the regulatory mechanism. So just to introduce in the problematic that I'm working on, uh, when we talk about the splicing is this process by which the introns or the non-coding sequences are uh, removed from this mature transcript and uh, to produce a final mature transcript that uh, fortunately will lead to a uh, protein. But this process is carried out by the, one of the more uh, complex and fascinating machinery in eukaryotic cells that is the spliceosome and that we love so much. <laughs> Um, this process is highly dynamic. You need uh, to, there are a lot of rearrangement between the splicing factor that are those proteins and RNAs and small RNAs that recognize a specific uh, signals or sequences in the mature RNA, they assembly, and then they produce the reaction to release the final product. 
This process is highly regulated, especially at the beginning of the reaction. Here I'm showing with colors, um, we uh, have a, like an ontology for this uh, a large amount of factor. And this ontology has to do with the type of complex, complexes that they, they, they form and also the order of the, the R assembly. It is not uh, by random, it's really uh, regulated. But now um, we are more uh, interested in the alternative uh, option that this splicing machinery have. And uh, here is uh, the concept of alternative splicing that is something that is, uh, uh, of course, uh, fascinating for us. And this is uh, alternative splicing occurs when this spliceosome is able to decide between different splicing sites. In humans, more than 95% uh, of the genes uh, suffer alternative splicing. At, at the end, of course, uh, we have um, incre we increase the diversity in terms of proteins and regulation. But how uh, does alternative splicing occur and how it is uh, controlled? In fact, we have a lot of factors that we will call collectively trans element that will be recruited with, uh, to the uh, pre-mRNA by a specific signal that are in the, in the transcript. So depending on which are the signals, you can have uh, something that is repressing or enhancing the, the splicing of a given exon, for example, uh, here. So, what is fascinating is that the result, the output of the interaction between the factor and the signal that are present in the transcript is what finally produces the, 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 the result. So this is for us the main question in the alternative testing uh, community that we are. So with this, we, we want to uh, answer at some point uh, which are the factors that are uh, acting together to provide a given output, and of course, which are the features that are required for this factor. This is a functional question that we that they want to address. For this reason, um, I joined to the lab uh, three years ago when uh, was in, at the same time was performed a huge experiment trying to find some uh, uh, insight in this mechanistic uh, question that we have. In, and in this experiment, what we did uh, was to knock down in parallel, in an automa automatic manner, around 300 factors, a splicing factor and core component of the splicing machinery in HeLa cells, so we are working on human, and, uh, to co and collect the result, the RNA, after this perturbation on the cells. And after the perturbation, uh, when we can measure using RNA-seq technologies and uh, in a high coverage, because we are measuring splicing now, and after uh, this, what we can think is that uh, we can measure the, how was the perturbation on the transcriptome after the knockdown of each of the factors. So if, if we think that uh, if two factors have similar perturbation profile, perhaps they have, or most probably they will be functionally related. So with this in mind, what we want to do now is to try to reconstruct the mechanism between uh, uh, that happen in, during this interaction. So this is the key concept of the project. Now uh, we are, I will explain some result of this. At the end of the day, after collecting the sequencing data, what, what I have is a big matrix where, um, in fact, I have uh, columns that are uh, representing the, the, the different samples that we didn't knock down. And in rows, we have in the row we have the, all the possible events, the alternative placing event that we could measure. These events are classified according to six level, that is the type of event. Today I will talk about exon skipping, that is an alternative placing event that occurs when an exon is alternatively uh, included or not in the final transcript. And also uh, intron retention, that the despite was very popular in plants at the beginning now. Is, be is becoming very popular, especially with this in diseases that they are that they have problem with the splicing. Intron retention implies that the intron is present in the final product. So we have the rows, the events, but also this event, this exon, this intron. We have a lot of features where, where uh, we can describe them. So uh, in the opposite, in the columns, we have these splicing factors that also have uh, their their own ontology. So we have a lot of information that we can now integrate and we want to uh, integrate using network science and network models. 
briefly to just because we are in, in bioinformatics uh, uh, atmosphere, I can provide detail later. But uh, what we what I did is to select first, for example, here is a, like a default protocol for bioinformatics is uh, to select from this big matrix just the rows that correspond to type of event that is exon skipping that are those that are in blue. So then uh, once we select the event, uh, it's impossible to use all the information. We have to decide which is the, which are the more informative events to, to build a network. So we decided to use the more changing one according to the distribution of change and to use the upper quartile of the distribution. And then we apply, I apply a, like a bootstrapping a, a strategy. Once I select the more informative event, I uh, estimate the full discovery rate that uh, the, I, I estimate some parameter to uh, ha, uh, have the best, uh, to avoid as much as possible the false positive. And using random sampling 10,000 times, I compute 10,000 networks and I check for each of the links that I could recover using correlation, which was the frequency in the 10,000 times that I did the, this uh, analysis. So at the end, what I have is for each link or for each pair of correlation between the factors, like a distribution of frequency, and I select the most uh, reliable ones. Uh, at the end, what I have is a network like the one that you have at, at the end. In this case, this network is representing uh, Exxon, Exxon network. And you can see very, very simple analysis that you have communities that inside the communities you have colors and these colors are, uh, are uh, the colors that are supposed to be in the complexes. So using this uh, network analysis very fast, I can recover functional relationship in this network. But of course, this is just the start of the problem. Now I have, I can play a lot with this data. See, here is just an example of how many networks now I'm producing. I, here I have a network produced using, for example, Exxon Skipping or in the below, uh, Intron retention, so we have, uh, and also I can apply different criteria. For example, uh, build network using short exon, long exon, or, GC, or low GC content exon, high GC content, and uh, I have now to find which are the mechanism behind this uh, this different reconstruction. First, inside the first thing, very simple thing that we can do is just to see, check the communities, check a specific factor because all of us have a, a favorite factor. So we, we go, we check, and we follow across all the network where is our factor. And also, we can check the, top, the overall topology of the network. But of course, this is completely simple for the amount of data and information that we have. So very simple thing that we can do. And also, you have to think that I, I'm working in the context of biology. So they want a very fast answer on how to find fast the difference in the network, something that we are using a lot, this kind of plot, where here I'm representing the each of the factors, the knockdowns in the rows, and in the different columns, I have the different data set, the different network that we have with colors here, presence. I, I, I represent that uh, the, if the factor, if the node is present in the network, I put color, and also I represent here the, the centrality of the of the node in the different networks. So very simple assumption that we can do is that if something is constitutively uh, present, uh, it should be something really central and really important. If you have a problem with the factor, of course, we will have a massive disruption of, the, of the splicing. On the opposite, if we have something that is very specific of a subset of event, that for example, this, this uh, protein chirp that is only present when I do, uh, when I build network with short exon, what we expect is that, um, if we have a problem with the factor, we will affect mostly short exon. But this kind of conclusion are infinite, of course. Now we are working a lot with this data. This is just a, sum, this is just a, a small portion of all the network that we have built. Another point of view of analyzing this kind of data is querying the links. And here, of course, not only the presence of the factor uh, matter, but also the, the partners. Here is just an example, a proof of principle showing that we could uh, recapitulate two well-known links uh, for a uh, functional relationship between a splicing factor, like, like this one, IK, IK mo one that was uh, described to be really important for uh, the splicing of short intron. And surprisingly, what we found is that, yes, it was uh, connected in all the network except of 
this that was for long introns and uh, another one is this example that we are uh, also is under under revision now that they describe a relationship between these three proteins that were described to affect the specifically short exon and low GC content exon and this is exactly what we are seeing that we couldn't record this link in any of the other networks. So this kind of question and this kind of conclusion is what we are now uh, struggling a lot to, to, to find new things. Last but not least, this is a part of a functional analysis. Another approach that we can do with this data is, as I said, analyze which are the features that are defining this clustering. And this is, a, is the most interesting part. This is what I like more. Because here we have, a, a, as I said at the beginning, all the features that the, the transcript have. And we have a tool that we can test if there is an enrichment on around a 75 feature and 65 feature for intron. So what we can do is just to select which are the, the events that are affected for each specific knockdown and to test which is the significance of each the feature. And what we expect is that if two knockdowns or two factors are affecting the same type of exon or introns in terms of features, what we expect is that they, they, they are together in terms of, they, they, they will correlate or will be together in terms of uh, significance. So we did this and this is very simple uh, picture of what, what we can get. But yes, uh, in fact, we can recover uh, the information that we can recover one, from one side, from the perturbation profile, with the uh, feature profile. So with this, we are reinforcing, it's just a crosstalk between data, it's nothing that is external, uh, that the, the communities at some point are recovering um, information about the feature of the transcript. So this is just a starting point of our work, because now we can explore uh, this in, a, in deep, but without a limit. So to conclude, and this is a part from my, also my part as bioinformatician in the lab, I was very concerned from the beginning on how to share this data because it's a lot. And you, you have to think that this RNA seq for 300 factor at the same time. So we are not only having this information about the splicing, we have gene expression, cross-regulatory networks, uh, and a lot of data that you can derive from, from RNA seq. So we decided to mount a graph database using Neo4j technology for the storage of the networks. And now on this uh, local database, we mounted a website where you can do exactly uh, what, uh, what I show, for example, querying the different networks and comparing intersection union or finding a specific factor and, and find where it's connected, how is the connectivity in the different so. Uh, this is a very powerful tool and now uh, and we will, of course, it's public and we will share with the community. So to, to summarize and the take home message of my talk that uh, we, we are uh, able now with this huge experiment that we have, uh, we have design, uh, designed at some point a protocol and, and, and a tool to explore uh, alternative placing regulation in a highly detailed manner. And that we are able to find a, evidence for published and well-known interaction. And now uh, we are in condition to start generating new, new hypotheses in order to describe this functional interaction. And something that for me is the more challenging part now is how to explore this interaction between the trans element and the RNA feature separating them together um, to provide new hypotheses in terms of mechanism. So the, the aspect of the, to share with the community, we, we mounted this uh, website that of course is public available for the community. Uh, so with this, I finish. I want to thank a lot for the opportunity again. This is my, my team. I, the, the lab is led by Juan Valcarcel and, uh, at CRG. And I want to especially thank the organizers. And if you want to find me, if you need any question, I have, here is my Twitter and my GitHub. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Stefania for your amazing talk. Now uh, we are going to introduce the, if we don't have a, a very nice talk, we do not have questions. So we are going to move, first we want to thank for your talk and we move forward to the next speaker. Let me, here, no. 
I lose the name of the, the last speaker. Mayara, are you there? Yes, thank okay. you. Mayara. Mayara, Mayara, welcome. Yes, it's right. Thank you. You can. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so just a second. Um, I hope you all have some energy left for the last talk before uh, the break. And it's going to be about drug repositioning for chronic inflammatory diseases using a network medicine approach. Um, but before uh, going deeper on the topic, I'd like to present you the team involved in this project. So I am Mayara from, from University of Sao Paulo. Tomás and Vivi are the co-advisors, and now there is the PI from Computational Systems Biology Laboratory. So now we can go to the topic. And there are more common chronic inflammatory diseases such as osteoporosis, arthritis, and psoriasis. But the list of disorders uh, of chronic inflammatory disorders is actually very long. And for this work, we used a list containing 28 chronic inflammatory diseases. And this group is characterized for um, containing complex heterogeneous and multifactorial disorders that usually have a slow progression and a long lasting uh, development. And the silent progression results in a clinical manifestation uh, in an irreversible state of tissue lesion. So this scenario makes most of the treatments be focused on symptoms and also controlling of inflammation in not such a specific way. So it points out the need for new treatments, but uh, drug development is actually very expensive and uh, time consuming. So it takes an average of 15 to 20 years and costs two to $2 billion. So it's important that you try to reduce PND costs and time. And one way of doing so is by using drug repositioning approach. So there are many ways to do drug repositioning, but I'm going to focus on the approach we use in this work. So if we know the genes that are related to, to disorders, and for example, we have an effective drug to treat disorder A, uh, if we know that those two disorders share some genes, and if this drug affects those shared genes, why not to try to use this drug to treat disorder B that uh, does not have an efficient treatment? But how can we know the genes that are shared among disorders and also among disorders and drugs? One way of doing so is by using IBM Watson for drug discovery. It's a pow powerful tool uh, capable of reading millions of articles available on biomedical literature. And it uh, looks for key terms of interest. And more than that, it's capable of connecting those terms of interest. Uh, so we need to organize the data uh, we get from Watson, and we can do that by using knowledge networks, which are the main tool of network medicine. And the assumption of network medicine is that phenotype of diseases reflects different pathophysiological processes that interact as a complex network. So if you change one element of the network, you're actually changing the whole network. And according to network medicine, this is how uh, pathologists behave. So the goals of the present work are build a network that connects genes and chronic inflammatory diseases based on biomedical literature data that was raised by Watson, then identify modules on this network, uh, also identify biological pathways that are functionally enriched uh, in the genes of each module, and finally identify drugs with potential for repositioning using a network medicine framework. So again, the, that initial list containing 28 chronic inflammatory diseases was submitted to a round of search in Watson. And all the information regarding the, those diseases and the genes related to them available until 2018 were organized uh, in a knowledge network. And this network was then organized in modules. And for that, we used R and GFI. So if you're not familiar with GAFI, this is the interface 
And this is actually the first version of our network. So uh, here it's clear that we need uh, to organize all this data in order to be able to extract biological and relevant insights from that. Uh, in this case, we organized the modules that I told you before. So just going one step back uh, to refresh or to get you to know, uh, the nodes represent each element of the network and the edges connect the uh, two nodes and the modules um, makes that nodes that are more connected among them uh, are, are inside one module and they are less less connected with the nodes that are inside another module. And in the present work, we use the Lovine method, uh, which is an um, optimized method of community detection. So this is our final network. Here in the middle, uh, we can see the genes that are shared among diseases. And here uh, we can see the exclusive genes related to each of them. And it's actually a disease gene network, and it's organized in five modules. Uh, each, of the, each of them has a different color. And it's important to state that disease with similar pathologies uh, group in the same module. So for example, the gray module contains rheumatic diseases that affect bones. The yellow one has systemic autoimmune disorders and also blood and vessels related disorders. The blue module contains gastrointestinal tract related diseases and also allergic and hypersensitivity diseases. The pink module grows Lyme disease and arthritis and the, the green module has only psoriasis, which is interesting because it's a disorder um, better known to be a skin related disorder. So after organizing the information in the Within, uh, using a network, we run a functional enrichment analysis. And for that, we use the G-Profiler and the data source was Reactome. And here is a G-Profiler output. So here is the gene set of one module. And here are the enriched pathways. And we can see to which gene each enriched pathway is related to. And it's interesting to see that the more heterogeneous model, such as the yellow one, uh, have more genes and more enriched pathways than the more specific modules such as the green module. So we organize the key information uh, from functional enrichment analysis and uh, it's possible to see that more unspecific uh, immunologic functions were, in, uh, was, were enriched uh, for more than one module. But we also could see more specific functions, uh, for example, the RENX2 function that was enriched for bone diseases module. And we know from the literature that RENX2 is important to trigger osteoblast maturation. And also for the green module uh, that contains psoriasis, we could see more skin related functions. So after organizing and better understanding the information we got from Watson, we could finally propose drugs with potential for repositioning. And for that, we used the network medicine framework that was developed and already published by our group. And I'm going to go uh, step by step with you right now. So that first um, search in Watson gave us a list of drugs known to be related to CIDs. I'm going to call chronic inflammatory disease CIDs from now on. So we have this list of drugs and we also have a list of genes related to those disorders. And this initial list was used to build the network I showed you before. And before, uh, from this initial list, we extracted uh, we excluded the genes that affected more than one disorder. So we have a list now containing only uh, exclusive genes. And this new list was submitted to uh, a new round of search in Watson so that we could know which drugs uh, affected those exclusive genes. But we wanted to propose novel drugs. So we removed the drugs that uh, were known to be related to CIDs. And from this list, we actually extracted the drugs that affected more than one target because we wanted to propose novel and also uh, more specific drugs. And uh, we got a final list from where we extract 25% of the elements in order to validate the relationship suggested by Watson. So here is an example of true uh, relationship. So according to Watson, that those two ter terms should be related. And when you go to the reference, we can see that this is actually true. Uh, 
And here is an example of Watson mistake. So Watson suggests that BLT should be related to this drug. But when uh, we go to the references, you can see that the BLT referred by Watson is actually different from the gene BLT. So this is a false relationship and we excluded uh, all the false relationships in order to avoid false positive uh, relations potentially given by Watson. Uh, so after all that, we finally got a list of selected drugs. And from that, we could go uh, deeper on the relations between drugs and CIDs and finally propose drugs with potential for repositioning. So I'm going to give you some examples of our results. Uh, starting from arthritis, uh, I'm going to highlight P3 gene uh, that according to Watson should be related to those two chemicals. So going to the literature, we could see that P3 uh, PIG 3 cg is enhanced in synovial fibroblasts from uh, arthritis patients, and that is related, probably related to joint destruction. Uh, we also know that PIG3 is related to IL-17 production, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So we propose that if you um, inhibit PIG3 by using those chemicals suggested by Watson, we can maybe decrease cartilage destruction, destruction mediated by um, it, the products of this gene. Uh, we also have um, evidence in the literature uh, corroborating this suggestion. So this chemical was already injected in urine model and the animals uh, showed uh, a decrease in clinical and histological signs of inflammation. And also Duvelizib, the second chemical, uh, have already been submitted to clinical trials phase two to treat arthritis, corroborating uh, those two chemicals as potentially uh, drugs to treat arthritis and also uh, reinforcing the potential of this pathway. Uh, now talking about osteoporosis, uh, I'm going to highlight, highlight Alday2 and Dizin. So Alday2 uh, has a common inactivating SNP related to hip fractures and osteoporosis. So um, it reinforces the relation of Alday2 with uh, osteoporosis, validating the relation uh, suggested by Watson. And also, according to Watson, Dizin um, is related to Alday2, which is true. And also, uh, we could see from the literature that uh, applying Dizin in vitro uh, stimulated osteoblast proliferation and differentiation via RENX2, which the VIA I told you in, uh, it was enriched for bone diseases. And also it prevented bone loss in over-optimized mouse. So all this uh, reinforced the potential of this drug uh, for treating osteoporosis. And least talking about psoriasis, I'm gonna highlight the corticotrophin release hormone uh, receptor type one, and also those two chemicals suggested by Watson. So this hormone is known to be secret secreted under stress conditions, and it's also related to brain-skin connection, uh, which in turn is related to mast cell-mediated peripheral inflammation. We also know that the receptor type 1 of corticotrophin release hormone uh, is co-localized with mast cells in psoriatic plaques from patients. So we suggest that by inhibiting this receptor, by using, for example, the drugs that were pointed out by Watson, we can maybe decrease the inflammation that is related to this receptor. So in conclusion, we can say that diseases with similar pathologies share more genes among them and therefore are in the same module. Uh, also, most of the genes that, and their rigid functions are related to immune system. Uh, the breakthrough of this work is actually the novel uh, drug CID association from known connections between genes and diseases and also between genes and drugs. And with all that, we can say that we have an efficient method to point out drugs that present potential for repositioning. So we are still working on this data. So if you have uh, any questions or comments on that, it would be a pleasure to talk with you. And I'd like to talk again to thank again the lab groups that made this uh, project possible, and also the organization and all, uh, everyone that is attending the event today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayara. It's great.
talk also. Uh, we have a question from Wendy Gonzalez. She asks, have you found any gene targeting an ion channel? Uh, until now, no. We actually still need to explore a little bit more all the information we've got for, from the network organization. But until this point, we didn't find uh, any ion channel as a target. Sorry. <laughs> There is no more questions. Well, thank you, Maria Mayara. Nice talk. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank all, all the speakers for the presentation today. Uh